Everybody's awfully quiet since I started recording. <laughs> well, after our legal briefing the last time. <laughs> Aaron, you doing okay? I am. Yes. Good. Did, uh, did you have a good weekend? I did. I did. Good. Yeah. Okay. Getting getting close to the big day of, uh, you know, I'm having a baby next month. So. Oh, congratulations! <laughs> I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't yeah, know that either. Awesome. Well, we haven't seen you in a year. I know. I th I told y'all. I told some people at a meeting several weeks ago, but I know because no one's seen me. No one knows. But yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Thank Wonderful you. boy or girl? Do you know? Don't know. We're not finding out. Yeah, I don't blame you. Good yeah. for you. The biggest yeah. surprise of your life. Yep. Yep. I know. I guess I've announced that to the public now. <laughs> it's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but anyone seeing me walking down the street knows immediately. So it's no surprise. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> Looks like we've got Erica now. <clears throat> hey, Tori. Hey, Dinas. How was your weekend? Oh, it was lovely. How about yours? It was good. Working Where off my honeydew. Good, good. Did you stay here in Charleston? I did. I uh, stayed here and did some exploring by car oh. <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> also by own foot. I mean, I can't, I mean, while I'm living right downtown, I can't help but like just get out and walk and notice a million different things every time. Oh, um, yeah. But. Good for you. Good for you. I'm going to go ahead and let the uh, first applicant end to the meeting. Great. Do you want me to get started with administration stuff, David? Sure. Sure. We're recording now. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the April 19th, 2021 meeting of the City of Charleston's Design Review Board. My name is Erica Chase, the board's chairperson. The members of the board with us tonight are Jeff Johnson, Dina Sleolio, Aaron Stevens, and Andy Smith. Members of city staff are David Meeks, Corey Parrish, and Andrea DeRungs. We do not have any agenda items that have been deferred, and we do not have any board members that are recused from the agenda tonight. The order of the meeting will be as follows. David will give the project and context overview for each project. Then the applicant team will have time to make their project presentation. We do typically limit those to about 10 minutes. Um, however, if additional time is needed, if you could please let me know at the start of your presentation. We are being a little bit flexible given the virtual meetings um, that are currently still going on. Um, we will then open up the meeting for board questions and then public comments. Public comment period is also limited to 10 minutes. Um, Anyone that is speaking, if you could please state your name for the record. And just like the project presentation timeframe, we are being a little bit flexible given um, the virtual meeting protocol right now. Then uh, David will give city staff recommendations and then the applicant team may have time to respond or clarify to public comments or city staff comments with a five minute time limit. Then we will enter into board discussion and a motion. During this time, the applicant may only clarify inaccurate information when recognized by myself or if asked a question specifically um, to the team by one of the board members. If everyone could please silence or turn off all cell phones or any devices that make noise, 
Um, I do want to remind everyone that our board does not have purview over zoning issues such as land use, building density, traffic, or flooding. We only have um, purview over the site design and architecture and aesthetics of the project. So with that, we will get started with agenda item number one, 534 Savannah Highway, requesting the demolition of a two-story single family home. I didn't have any context for this since we've seen it before. So I'll turn it over to the applicant to start the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Sting and I'm a licensed architect with LS3P. We would like to request some additional time if possible. Sure thing, Lindsay. How much time do you think you would need um, additionally? 10 minutes, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just and let me know when to advance the slides, Lindsay. Sure, you can go ahead and go to our first slide. Thank you. Um, I am here today to request full demolition of 534 Savannah Highway, which is located on the north side of Highway 17 between West Harrison Road and Parrish Road. After the DRB denied the demolition application in September of 2018, the owner hired a licensed contractor to protect and temporarily stabilize the structure by disconnecting power to prevent any electrical issues and shorts and to discourage any vagrants, install temporary shoring on the second floor below the existing rafters that are not attached securely to the ridge, installed tarps at the roof to prevent any further water damage, removed all miscellaneous materials from the interior to reduce the live and dead loads, and secured the windows and door openings to prevent any un unauthorized access. In addition, the owner has hired two licensed structural engineers to reassess the facility and determine if the facility was salvageable for the DRB. Both structural engineer reported that the facility is unstable and subject to collapse. And to correct these conditions, the entire facility must be demolished and full reconstruction is required. This is in direct conflict with the board's initial findings and therefore, we would like to present this case again today to the board. In addition to the structural engineer reports, the fire marshal has deemed the building unsafe and has prevented entry to the facility. And lastly, the owner has garnered outstanding support of the surrounding community with over 660 signatures and 25 letters supporting the demolition of this facility, along with the support of several elected and public officials. We have also several Letters stating that the Ashley River Bridge District, nor anyone from Moreland neighborhood, has reached out to their residents regarding this application, and a vote was not taken for or against this application. This information was all sent to the board this morning. Next slide. The property is located within the Savannah Highway overlay, which is intended to allow office and neighborhood service uses in addition to the uses allowed in the base zoning district. Next slide. The overlay also states that the existing principal buildings will be retained to every extent possible, which was the owner's intent at the purchase of this property. The owner is very familiar with the overlay district and its intent. Dr. Wisner owns a facility similar in size and aesthetic located at 540 Savannah Highway in which he was able to salvage the structure and renovate the facility, which has enhanced the value of properties located within the overlay district. For those board members that did not sit on the board at the time of our previous application, I would like to tell you a little bit about the process which has led us here today. In 2017, we met with both the city of the Charleston zoning office, as well as the DRB city staff to review the existing property and to better understand the city's process for demolition. At that time, this property was purchased. It was the last remaining in the, in the county located within the Savannah Highway overlay zone which meant that if it had remained in the county, it could have been demolished without board approval. When we met with the city's DRB staff, we asked the city how they would feel if the house was demolished while still in the county. The city addressed the question by conveying that they were optimistic that going through the city process would be advantageous and show goodwill between the owner and the city as to respect the public process. With the city staff initial support for demolition, Dr. Wisner felt it was best interest of the community to annex into the city and proceed through the DRB for a demolition permit. In addition, the demolition of 506 St. Andrews Boulevard sets legal precedent for demolition of a property in, within the Savannah Highway Overlay District with similar structural damage beyond repair. Next slide. We are proposing to demolish the existing building along with the existing curb cut off of Savannah Highway. 
Deleting the curb cut out on Savannah Highway will ease ingress and egress into a busy traffic pattern. Next slide. The existing one and a half story building was built in 1951 and is not historically significant. There's minimal architectural ornamentation and the overall building lacks architectural merit. The building is not particular to the characteristics of Charleston. And in fact, this home could be found in just about anywhere in America. Next slide. In addition to the lack of architect architectural merit from Savannah Highway, the home has a very awkward addition to the rear, which is visible from the street. A previous owner added a second floor addition without providing structural reinforcement of the existing exterior walls, piers, or foundation. As noted in the license structural report, the brick piers and foundation must be entirely replaced with new continuous footings to meet current seismic design requirements. Also noted in the license structural reports, the existing rafters were raised at the rear of the house, which resulted in the severe overcut of the rafters at the ridge bearing, which does not meet code. The rafters must be replaced in their entirety. Next slide. This addition even further reduces the architectural quality of the building. The east elevation image depicts the brick veneer at the gable wall near the ridge, which has fallen away from the building. Per the license structural report, the brick veneer should be demolished as soon as possible to, re to remove the falling hazard, which is a life threat to safety. Per, per the license structural reports, there are no connection between the brick veneer and exterior walls. The veneer is not a structural element. Instead, it relies on the building for lateral support. The building is not stable due to the absence of wall sheathing. Per the license structural reports, the absence of the brick ties require the absence of brick ties requires the removal and replacement of all brick veneer. Related to this issue is the lack of sheathing for the exterior walls. To correct these conditions, the exterior walls, both the wood framing and brick veneer, must be demolished completely and rebuilt. Next slide. That's okay. Thank you. The approaching entry photo depicts the drive where the original concrete driveway has been removed and replaced with a pervious drive for the ar arborist inspection to protect the green oak at the front entry of the property. Next slide. The interior photographs I am presenting today were taken on June 19th, 2018. The fire marshal inspected the property in August of 2020 and found that the building was unsafe. Therefore, re-entry to update these photographs was not permitted. Per the license structural report, the floor framing throughout lacks the, the required live load capacity. To correct these deficiencies, the existing framing must be replaced. Next slide. Per the structural report, the windows are not framed properly and do not meet code. All windows must be removed and reframed. Next slide. For the license structural reports, there is extensive water damage throughout the facility. This damage occurred prior to the purchase of this property. Next slide. Again, you can see the extensive damage of the subfloor system due to water damage and rot. Next slide. Water damage to the floor and wall framing has progressed due to continuing water intrusion. As we noted previously, the first and second floor joists are not adequate for IBC live load requirements. The existing floor framing is not adequate and the entire floor framing requires replacement. Next slide. For the license structural reports, the existing roof structure is not serviceable and the framing will require replacement to correct the current deterioration and deficiencies. Next slide. In conclusion, the deterioration and deficiencies presented today are widespread. The foundation is undersized and failing, and it must be replaced. To replace the foundation, the house must be jacked up. To jack up the home, the brick veneer must be removed first, as it is not tied to the house, nor is it a structural wall. Once removed, the brick could be salvaged, clean, and used in the reconstruction of the facility, but it must first be completely removed. The roof cannot be replaced until the roof rafters have been replaced. The rafters cannot be replaced until the foundation is fixed. This leads to an entire home being demolished piece by piece in order to repair. We ask the board to consider this exhaustive effort when considering our demolition application. This building is structurally unsound and unsalvageable, which poses a threat to the health, safety, and welfare of the public. The fact is that this building needs to be demolished based on the structural findings alone. 
In addition to these structural findings, the facility holds no historical significance and its application has garnered, garnered a tremendous amount of neighborhood and community support. And for these reasons, we believe this building is worthy of demolition. I thank you for your time and I will now turn over my time to Matthew Wilkes, one of the licensed structural engineers that provided a structural report for this application. The remainder of the slides show the structural report submitted to the board. Uh, <clears throat> do I just go ahead and start speaking? Am I on? Yes, you're on. All right, great. So my name is Matthew Wilkes. I am a professional engineer and I practice structural engineering here in Charleston. Uh, the name of my firm is MW Design LLC. I think my letter and the letter from Mr. Mark Caldwell of Atlantic Engineering, uh, which is provided and referenced by Lindsay, speak for themselves. The majority of the structural components of these houses are either undersized or damaged or beyond repair. The foundation is undersized and failing. Large portions of the floor system are undersized and failing. Large portions of the roof system are undersized and failing. The brick veneer is lacking lateral ties and support and is failing. There are little to no lateral load resistance, which is a major concern during an earthquake or hurricane. To try to repair these, this house, it would first need to be lifted and stabilized by a house mover to construct a new foundation. This alone would require the removal of the brick veneer. It would then require a complete rebuild of every portion of the structure, a new foundation, new floor framing, new wall framing, new wall sheathing, new roof framing, new brick veneer. Um, my client did not hire me to just find a way to demo this building. He consulted with his architect, his builder, and me, a structural engineer, to try and find a way to use the existing structure. We all first visited this site in the spring of 2017, and we all came to the same conclusion. Uh, Dr. Wisner, my client, even hired another structural engineer for a second opinion. Of course, renovation with an addition would have been a much more economical way to approach this project. But unfortunately, this building was constructed with materials, means, and methods that do not meet current standards and was not properly maintained for decades. I have worked to save several historic buildings downtown, billion dollar projects, down to a Habitat for Humanity home with a very tight budget. Every project is different, but <clears throat> most have one thing in common. They all have good bones to work with. There, they were solid old growth lumber framing with true two inch wide studs, heavy four by eight inch rafters and old school framing techniques. You know, really cool stuff. Uh, this structure is different. It's just mass produced dimensional lumber built when these new materials were just beginning to be understood. This house is not structurally sound. Much of the opposition to demolition appears to be focused on a new building fitting in with the surrounding neighborhood. The fact is that this building needs to be demolished. What is built back is up to the owner and the architect, which must go through the DRB approval process. All parties with opposition will have an opportunity for input throughout the design process going forward. Again, as I stated in my letter, and as Mark Caldwell stated in his letter, as professional engineers licensed in the state of South Carolina, this building is unsafe and it should be demolished as soon as possible. Thank you. And the uh, next speaker will be Dr. James Wisner. And I guess maybe we can just scroll through the, uh, the other letter as well. If you wanna go through the slides real quickly, that'd be fun. I should, give me one moment to let in the doctor. Okay. <clears throat> you want me to just continue scrolling? Yeah, sure. These are just kind of pictures reiterating. These were taken back in 2017. Um, so you can keep on going through this showing how poorly the structure, what shape it's in. Um, a lot of water damage, a lot of rot, um, inadequate foundation. Let me keep on scrolling. And this is the letter from uh, Mr. Mark Caldwell, also a PE. I'm going to scroll. Again, just more pictures showing how poor the, the structure is in. Okay, I believe that's it. All right. So next up would be J Dr. Jay Wisner. Okay, you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you listening to our, uh, to our situation. Um, our request for demolition should not be taken lightly. 
but it should be used as an example of how to do it right. We've gone beyond our responsibilities for due diligence. We have multiple professional reports that prove the property is an, is an immediate safety hazard, cannot be restored and must be demolished. We have engaged the community and garnered huge public support with no opposition whatsoever. We even annexed from the county into the city because we, are, we were advised the city would support our request for demolition when brought to the DRB. We've reached out to Charleston's leaders. Mayor Tecklenburg and his wife visited the property. Ross Appel has visited the property. The city fire marshal wouldn't even walk up the stairs due to the poor structural condition. Christopher King and the Preservation Society have aided in our efforts. All of these community leaders support our effort, even if they can't take a public stance on it. I've been an excellent member of the Moreland community and a steward for my three properties. One is my dental office. One is a fully restored home for my mother. And the final is this property. I spent the time, money, and effort in an attempt to rehab this property just like my mother's home. But after exposing the structure, it was deemed impossible. Unfortunately, as my structural engineers have reported, the home and its brick veneers cannot be saved at any cost. <clears throat> There's been no vote of opposition or resident poll by the Moreland community or the Ashley Bridge District Board. Their stance is simply on principle, but not facts, and is certainly not the will of their people. We are a shining example of the proper steps that should be required to demolish a hopeless structure in the commercial corridor. I'm willing to preserve as much of the existing brick as possible for a future project, but the home cannot simply be repaired. The brick must be completely removed. Of course, we plan to work hand in hand with the DRB to ensure any new structure will complement the existing fabric of the commercial corridor and blend with the overall aesthetic. Demolition of the existing structure is what's right for the community and it's what the residents clearly desire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does that conclude your presentation from the applicant team? It does. Okay, thank you. Um, David, I realized we skipped over the virtual meeting protocol. Do you wanna go back to cover that uh, before we get into any public comment sure. periods? Um, and thank you to the applicant team for not missing a beat um, despite us skipping over this. I'll just kind of hit the highlights um, really quick. Um, that David will be controlling the PowerPoint presentation. And again, thank you to the first applicant team um, for knowing the queue on to letting him know when to um, advance to the next slide. Um, during our meeting, applicants, staff, and board members are required to give their name whenever, whenever speaking. The video and microphones have been disabled for all attendees, and attendees that are not board members or staff will only be given the capabilities to speak when they are called on during the public comment period. The chat and Q&A functions have been disabled for everyone. Um, for, with regard to public comments, um, the applicants and all team members and the public have been required to register indicating the project they wish to comment on and submit any documents in advance of the meeting. Just as an in-person meeting, all applicants heard today, applications heard today are part of a public meeting format. And if you have registered and will speak during the public comment portion of the meeting, you will need to state your name and address for the record. Those members of the public that have registered will be called on in order by project. Members of the public that speak are encouraged to remain in the meeting for the completion of the item they've commented on. And staff will call on the registered members of the public to speak for each project. Unregistered members of the public who raise their hand will not be called on. Um, and I believe that's it, David. I think we kind of covered everything else. Um, at the bottom of the page and on the presentation, there is a website and an email um, for anyone that would like additional information. Um, also, staff will issue meeting results, including staff comments and board motions to the applicants following the meeting, and staff re results will also be posted on the city website. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. So thank you for letting me backtrack to that. Um, are there any questions from the board to the applicant team? With none, um, we are now entering into the public comment period. Um, we do have a number of emails and letters that were received um, for this project. We also have a number of um, members of the public that have registered to speak. So we'll start with, with those members. Um, because we do have so much, um, many members of the public that are being engaged in this project, which, which is wonderful, if you could try and limit your time to around a minute so we can try and fit everyone in, that would be great. 
Um, so the first one that was registered to speak is Cassian Drolet. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. And it's Cassian Drolet, it's a tough one. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board. I'm Cashin Drolet. I'm Chief Advocacy Office Officer with Historic Charleston Foundation. The foundation does oppose the demolition of 534 Savannah Highway. Um, the subject property is located in the Moreland neighborhood and is considered historic. The preservation plan adopted by Charleston City Council proposed a Charleston vision that set forth a long-term direction for the city and serves as the foundation for future planning. The preservation plan pays a particular focus to West Ashley and preservation of the historic resources located there with an emphasis on its historic neighborhoods. West Ashley contains some of the earliest and most interesting early 20th century and post-World War II residential subdivisions, and Moreland is certainly among those. Moreland was developed in the 1940s and 50s and is characterized by one and two story brick buildings, large lots, tall trees, and adjacent marshlands. This house is architecturally important as part of a cohesive assemblage of similar buildings built within the same time period. This assemblage is important in telling the story of the growth of Charleston off of the peninsula and providing testimony to the rise of the automobile and pro-growth policies after World War II. The city preservation plan recommended oversight of rehabilitations, new construction and demolition in historic Moreland by designating it as a, as a conservation district. Um, demolition of 534 Savannah Highway is counter to that preservation plan and would um, demolish an important component of Charleston's history where there really are so few um, protections in place. And respectfully, Historic Charleston Foundation would encourage board members to deny the total demo demolition of the structure. Thank you. Ms. Donna Jacobs. Good evening, Madam Chairman and members of the Design Review Board. My name is Donna Jacobs and I'm a resident of Burns Downs and the current president of the Ashley Bridge District Board. Before you this evening is a request for demolition of an existing bungalow at 534 Savannah Highway in the heart of the Ashley Bridge District Savannah Highway overlay within the neighborhood of Moreland. The ABD Board has worked with an understanding that we support the position of an affected neighborhood when issues rise. The Moreland Neighborhood Association has forwarded letters to this board opposed the demolition for the reasons stated in their letters, which I believe are in front of you. Thus, we support the neighborhood's opposition for this demolition request. I would like to make a personal comment as a resident and long-term member of the Ashley Bridge District. First, in 2020, the South Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association awarded the Great Places Award in South Carolina to the Ashley Bridge District. This was a great honor and the first time such an award has been made off the peninsula of Charleston in this area. There are now three plans and two area character appraisals for, that directly speak to the fact that residents of West Ashley want to preserve the unique character of their neighborhoods. The Ashley Bridge District Plan adopted in 1997, the 2007 Preservation Plan for Charleston that has a title Vision, Community and Heritage, Area Character Appraisal for Burns Downs in 2009, Area Character Appraisal for Old Windermere in 2009, and Plan West Ashley adopted by Council in 2018. And all of these plans and appraisals recognition of the architectural fabric of the communities and how they tell the story of their, these neighborhoods is recognized as becoming increasingly more important. Preservation started 100 years ago on the peninsula that, with homes that were up for demolition. Some of our homes are approaching this age and the community would like consideration and respect for our history and story as well. The institution of the overlay was a specific recommendation in the ABD plan to address concerns of how properties were influenced. The Savannah Highway Overlay Zone came into being after the ABD was adopted in City Council. And I could speak for several minutes on the why, but one large why was because it was important to the eight neighborhoods in the district to respect and protect the residential border of our neighborhoods. It speaks to maintaining existing building. The most salient point today is under 54 224 Section C entitled building requirements that existing principal buildings shall be retained unless deemed structurally unsound by the chief building official. 
great thought went into this zoning and has served our residential area for 20 years. However, I, I have not read this current structural report submitted to the board. I did the first time and I will wager that this analysis the applicant paid for would recommend de demolition as it did and it, because it would be expensive and maybe inconvenient to renovate this bungalow. However, anything can be repaired and restored to former glory. There are many examples in West Ashley and Moreland Manor right down the street at 576 Savannah Highway is one such example. Thank, for, thank you for your attention this evening and consideration for the request to again oppose the demolition of the bungalow at 534 Savannah Highway. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey DeMille. Is there a Jeffrey DeMille on? David, did you see? He's, I've let him into the panel, asked to unmute. I see him in. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Somehow I was muted and didn't know it. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey DeMille, 747 Woodward Road. And I'd like to thank the DR board members for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Moreland Civic Club Zoning Committee in opposition to the applicant's request for demolition of a historic bungalow at seven, I'm sorry, at 534 Savannah Highway. Just as when the applicant made the same request in September of 2018 that was denied by the DRB, Moreland is vehemently opposed to this uh, demolition request. Moreland is very protective of its borders by Savannah Highway and St. Andrews Boulevard. The Savannah Highway overlay was designed to protect the city, Moreland and Windermere from issues like this. Over the years as a community, we have had to repeatedly oppose actions of this nature. It's very important to us to preserve the historic architecture, the looks and the feel of Moreland. And we respectfully ask that the DRB deny this application for demolition request again. Thank you. Thank you. John Musselman. John, can you hear us? Good sound. Did it. Looks like he's on. There we go. I just asked him to unmute. Everybody muted. We cannot hear you, Mr. Musselman. Hmm. Looks like he is not muted. John, can you hear us? Should we move on? Mr. Erica, uh, can yeah. you? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is John Musselman. Um, I own J. Musselman Construction. In transparency, I would be Jay's contractor on the project. However, I'm also speaking on behalf as a resident of the Ashley River Bridge District. Um, I own several commercial properties in the West Ashley area. My office is about 200 yards from Moreland. I currently live in South Windermere at the 330 Confederate Circle, which is a 1950 uh, era home that I've done remodeling to. to and I certainly uh, understand the architectural character of, of the neighborhoods. Um, I support Jay's efforts. Uh, I've worked with Jay on the renovation of 540 Savannah Highway uh, back in 2010, um, and very different from 534 Savannah Highway. Uh, 540 Savannah Highway um, had, as Matt Wilk said, had bones that were worth salvaging. Um, this house has a lot of issues structural that structural engineers have uh, talked about. I won't go into those. Um, as a contractor, I have remodeled old buildings. Um, I led the team that restored the people's building back in 2001. 
I also led the team that transformed the old Charleston High School to the College of Health Professions. The, the big difference here is that we have brick veneer that needs to be pinned back to the framing. Um, on both of those structures I talked about, they were both load-bearing masonry with structural steel. If this was an old house down in the peninsula that was wood siding, it'd be a much easier accomplishment to save. As both Lindsay and Matt Wilk said, the issue here is that we have to take the roof off, then take the rafters off, reframe the roof. Um, we still have to reinforce the floor joists between the first and second floor, as well as the first floor joists. And then we'd have to jack the entire structure up and put a new foundation in place. There's really not much of the original structure that can be salvaged other than the brick. Um, Matt Wilkes, Lindsay, and Dr. Wisner have all spoke about that. I've told Dr. Wisner that you know, we could certainly salvage the brick, take it off, and save it for reuse in a new structure. As Matt said, I won't go into the new structure. That's not really my role in the situation, um, but it would have to go through the DRB, obviously. Um, And as a resident of the Ashley River Bridge District, I know Ms. Jacobs spoke that the Ashley River Bridge District has uh, had communication with the residents, but I have not heard anything in either of the neighborhoods that I own properties in, Albemarle Point or South Windermere. And as far as I'm aware, none of my neighbors have had any discussions with that Ashley River Bridge District either. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. That concludes the registered members of the public to speak live. Um, I will now go through emails and letters that were received. Um, I will be summarizing them mostly because of, of our time constraints um, in the amount that have been received. Um, the first is from Nate Hertel at 554 Godfrey Park Place. Um, dear the Design Review Board, he's voicing support the demolition of the unsafe structure. Um, we should be looking at long-term impacts on neighborhood and talking about the new building, which really is in the purview of this application. Um, wants to express that as owners in Moreland and members of online neighborhood forums, there have been no public discussions, no neighborhood meetings, no flyers, no kind of contact to gauge the neighborhood sentiment about the proposal. This is in contrast to previous experience in the Ashley Forest neighborhood group where neighborhood association president would ask for input when items were coming up for discussion. Um, the next, Piece that I have is a petition um, signed by 534 people um, stating 534 Savannah Highway is a single family residence located in the Savannah Highway Commerce Commercial Corridor District. The structure is in hopeless condition and has been deemed structurally unsalvageable and a life safety hazard by two independent structural engineers. I support the demolition of the building at 534 Savannah Highway and the improvement of the site. The project will improve the overall aesthetic of the district, increase property values, and create small business jobs and tax revenue. Again, um, listed 534 people. I do want to note that there are no addresses um, listed with each individual person. Um, the next is a letter from Joseph Tecklenburg, 8 Moore Drive, um, writing to express my support for the improvement project. Um, he's a resident in the Westwood neighborhood and feels the project will have a positive impact on the community. Demolition of the structure is required due to a multitude of structural issues. Considers the structure to be an eyesore for West Ashley and that the owner will improve the property to benefit the neighborhood as a whole. Um, next one is from Christopher Betros, uh, Betros at 9 Nashmore Road. Um, as a resident and property owner of the Ashley Forest community, I have not been engaged with my community leaders regarding the project. To my knowledge, there has been no opposing vote held by my neighborhood board. Next is from Linda Wisner. As a resident and property owner of the Moreland community, I have not been engaged with my community leaders regarding the project at 534 Savannah Highway. To my knowledge, same thing, there have been no opposing vote held by neighborhood board. Um, same letter from Simon Wilson. Same letter um, from Sarah Kimber. No addresses unless I state them um, listed. Same letter from Christopher Stang at 28 Formosa Drive. Um, as a resident property owner of, Phi, of the Wapu Heights community, um, and same statement that they have not been engaged by my community-led leaders regarding the project. And to my knowledge, there has been no opposing vote held by my neighborhood board. Um, another 
from Dr. Johnny Weeks at 12 Formosa Drive, stating the same thing for Wapu Heights community. Um, there is a map um, that is also part of the public record showed, showing letters of support in relation to the structure at 534 Savannah Highway. Um, a letter from Dana McAfee as a resident and property owner of the Windermere community, same statement that they have not been engaged by community leaders regarding the project at 534 Savannah Highway. To my knowledge, there's been no opposing vote held by my neighborhood board. Um, another support petition um, was submitted. Similar summary that 534 Savannah Highway is a single family residence. Um, the structure is in hopeless condition and has been deemed structurally unsalvageable and a life safety hazard by two independent structural engineers. They're supporting the demolition um, with a number of signed um, signatures. Again, no addresses on this one. Um, a, another letter from Peter Tecklenburg, dear board, writing to express my support for the improvement project being planned. I'm a homeowner, homeowner in the Ashley River Bridge District, and I feel the project will have a positive impact on our community. Uh, there's a handwritten um, a blur below it. I'm going to do my best to interpret the handwriting. We went through this a year ago. Dr. Wisner has proven to be a good neighbor, and his practice has been the example of the type of business that can support their, um, if there has to be any business. Another letter from Alex Baylot, um, resident of the Ashley River Bridge District at 537 Elizabeth Lane West, um, expressing support. Same um, from the Maybank Law Firm at 531 Savannah Highway from Roy Maybank, um, stating that he is a resident and owner in the Ashley River Bridge, Ashley Bridge District, um, expressing support. Same from um, Mr. Ravenel, um, owner of 530 Savannah Highway, expressing support as well. Seen from um, LaFond Law Group at 544 Savannah Highway from Catherine LaFond, um, expressing support. Seen from Linda Wisner, um, stating as she is an owner in the Ashley Bridge District. Same from Andrew Brown, 530 Savannah Highway, expressing support. Same from Deborah King, 561 Godfrey Park Lane, expressing support. Same from Simon Wilson, expressing support, stating he's a resident slash owner in the Ashley Bridge District. Same from Sarah Kimber, um, saying that she's a resident and owner in the Ashley Bridge District. Neither of the last two have had addresses. Um, another from Pepper Law Firm at 548 Savannah Highway, expressing support. Another from John Cooper and Associates at 18C Leanbach Drive, um, expressing support. Concerned property owner within the Ashley Bridge District and support the proposed improvements um, due to the de deteriorated condition and the structure posing a safety hazard to the area. Um, same from John Musselman, um, who we heard from during the public comment period, expressing the support. And that Dr. Wisner previously renovated an abandoned house at 540 Savannah Highway. And again, Mr. Musselman's address was 330 Confederate Circle. Um, a letter from Christopher Beatros expressing support, currently residing in two properties in the Ashley Bridge District and in full support of the proposed project. West Ashley is lagging other areas of Charleston with regard to redevelopment and improvement, and he has the utmost confidence that this project will have a positive impact on our community from an economic and aesthetic perspective. He is at 9 Nashmore Road, 
Um, another letter of support from Charles Fitzhenry, who resides at Six Tranquil Drive in Wahoo Heights. Another letter of support from Rob Gamble, 21 Palmetto Road. Another letter of support, Brian Hornerens, um, who is a resident in the Ashley Bridge District. Another from Dana McAfee, 17 Jamaica Drive. Um, another letter of support, a similar template, same from Weston McAfee, 17 Jamaica Drive. Another from Cots and Anonyx, Jeffrey Cots, expressing support. Another from Christopher Stang, 28 Formosa Drive, expressing support. Stuart Feldman, no address, but states that no address. Um, Dr. Johnny Weeks, 12 Formosa Drive, expressing support. And then now I'll go through what is in opposition. Peggy Bone, 711 West Harrison Road, opposing demolition. She grew up in Moreland and have inherited their homes or bought back in the neighborhood. We have fought long and hard to keep the 1940s and 1950s character of the neighborhood that has provided such a wonderful quality of life for us and many generations who have called Moreland home. The area is highly sought after because of its charm. This is the second time in a short period of time that we've had to write letters opposing this demolition. Please deny this request and save a valuable near historic house that helps create a wonderful entrance to our beautiful city. Um, another from Marion Greeley, 701 Parish Road. Um, similar letter, Moreland is a firm believer in the Savannah Highway Overlay District and its protections for our community. The demolition of this bungalow does not support the architectural integrity of Moreland and West Ashley. A demolition such as this only provides precedent for more demolitions down the road for our community. Second time that a request has been made, um, with the first being in 2018, which is denied, Moreland did not support the request for demolition in 2018 and still does not in 2021. A similar letter from Paula Bum Bumpinger um, at 635 Parish Road. Um, same template as the previous, same from Andrea Whitfield at 752 Woodward Road, who is the uh, on the Moreland Civic Club Zoning Committee. Um, sorry, I apologize, I'm a few duplicates in here. Um, another letter from Kate Campbell, 736 North Godfrey Park Place. Um, Moreland is a member of the Ashley Bridge District in the first neighborhood entered, um, again, similar verbiage from the previous letters that I read and summarized. Another from Margaret McNabb Gale, 772 Woodward Road. Um, seeing she recently inherited one of the homes in Moreland at 772 Woodward. Um, She's been impressed at the recent accumulation of historical research and cultural innovations of West Ashley that have been made under the direction of the present mayor. Asked that these improvements continue in preserving the historic areas of West Ashley and asking to write, uh, writing to ask that the charming 1951 well-built home along Savannah Highway not be demolished. Another from Daryl Olson, 701 Parish Road. Um, similar verbiage as the previous ones read. A letter from Aaron Minigan, the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to the community and to us in this request. Based on our analysis of the materials submitted, the applicant presents a compelling argument that the structural deficiencies pose significant challenges to the rehabilitation of this building. However, this building contributes to the residential character of the district, which the Savannah Highway Overlay Zone prioritizes retaining to every extent possible. For this reason, we are hopeful that the form and materials the characteristics of Anna Highway facade can be saved and incorporated into the project moving forward. Um, and last letter received from Charlie Charles Smith at 333 Wapu Road, um, wish to object to the request before us to allow demolition. Subject property was acquired in 2016 by the owner of the two contiguous lots to the west of the property with the intent of creating a non-residential use comprised of three lots 
with 208 linear feet of frontage in Savannah Highway. The Ashley Bridge District zoning prohibits more than two lots from being combined for a non-residential use. Placing two lots in the name of one corporate entity and placing the third in another cannot defeat this rule. Additionally, Ashley Bridge District plainly states that existing structure shall be retained unless deemed structurally unsound by the city. There's no appeal provision for this rule and the opinion of a third party engineering firm while perhaps useful in the decision making of the city is merely advisory in this context. Requests for the demolition of this 576 Savannah Highway in the same block as the subject property were denied for 17 years before the owner finally did what the law required. In the meantime, the homes that vacant was purposely allowed to deteriorate. Um, I'm not gonna continue going into that since that's not relevant to this specific structure. Um, but 534 Savannah Highway has also been allowed to sit vacant and deteriorate for five years. Demolition by neglect cannot be rewarded and the length of time a building has been vacant is immaterial. The city recently denied the request for demolition of 62 Hanover Street. It's been vacant for 42 years. There's been discussion in advance of this meeting regarding the use of a disinterested third party being used to mediate some kind of settlement that would allow the applicant to demolish the structure and replace it with a building, incorporating design features similar to the applicant's building, which houses is non-residential use next door at 538 Samantha Highway. I would note that this public process and matters such as this makes no provision for third party mediators. I would also note that the award-winning Ashley Bridge District Plan is very specific as to the appropriate design criteria for the district. The one building in this block of Savannah Highway that has been built in recent years does not, that does not meet those criteria is the building that the applicant proposes to emulate in the replacement of 534 Savannah Highway. I ask you to deny this request. Um, so with that, that concludes our public um, comment portion of our meeting. I thank you everyone for your patience. Um, those are obviously very important, you know, for our community. So with that said, we are now um, at city staff recommendations. David, please. Thank you, Erica. Staff comments, 534 Savannah. Uh, the ordinance that discusses demolition in the purview of the design review board states that the board should consider the architectural and aesthetic features of the structure, the nature and quality of the structure, including its architectural fabric, any historical significance, the nature and quality of the surrounding area and the structure's contribution to the overall streetscape of the area. Additionally, the property is in the Savannah Highway Overlay, which is at section 55224, that states the existing principal buildings will be retained to every extent possible. Additionally, existing structures in the overlay zone that are used for non-residential use shall retain their residential appearance. Building additions and new structures shall be designed to look like the existing residential structures. Staff asked the applicant for a list of what the owner, 534 Savannah, had done to the building to stabilize, protect, and maintain the building from further deterioration um, since the denial in 2018. Um, uh, during the presentation, the architect went over the um, items that they did do after the denial. Uh, the power disc was disconnected. Um, they installed some temporary shoring on the second floor below the existing rafters, um, installed tarps at the roof to prevent further water damage, I removed all mis miscellaneous and materials uh, uh, from the interior and secured the windows and doors. Um, staff feels these steps were mainly to secure the building and very little was done to protect, to stabilize or maintain the building. Uh, staff feels demolition by neglect has played a role. Uh, the fire marshal's report provided by the applicant does not deem the building is unstable and ready to collapse, as the applicant indicated, and simply states violations needing corrections. Removing an extension cord uh, that was being fed to the building from next door and to lock the building so persons do not try and live inside. Um, <clears throat> staff reviewed the provided structural reports and building photos with the city's chief building official, Mr. Granada. Based on the information provided, the CBO is of the opinion that the building appears to be structurally stable and absolutely could be renovated. The existing building, such as, um, I'm sorry, the, the building code provides strategies and options which are commonly utilized for renovating existing buildings such as this. Uh, the CBO stated that the structural report that indicates many items are not to code 
is typical for all buildings of this age. Uh, any building can be stabilized and eliminated. Uh, staff has examined the above considerations when contemplating demolition for this property. We feel the existing building should be utilized in the expansion of the neighboring business, either partially, as in the front facade, or fully, per the Savannah Highway overlay. The staff does recommend the denial of demolition. Thanks, David. Does the applicant team um, would like to, they'd like to take time to respond or clarify any items from staff comments or the public comment period? I need to unmute people. I'm sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> yes, we would. Thank you. Um, we appreciate the public comment and um, the city staff's comments as well. Uh, I think what we're really struggling with here today is that in order to keep any front facade, the front, front facade would have to be completely dismantled and put back um, in order to create anything that resembles the fabric that's shown or the, the existing building shown there today. Um, we're really kind of at a sticking point. We've had many structural engineers come out and, and take a look at this building. Um, I also live in the Ashley River Bridge District in Wapu Heights. John Musselman, the contractor, also lives in South Windermere. We're, we're quite uh, familiar with this process. We're also very familiar with how to preserve buildings. Um, it was our intent when we were hired uh, by Dr. Wisner initially to preserve this building. There was no intent to demolish this. Um, but after we got in there and began to look around at what, uh, what the building looked like um, back in 2017 and still today, um, the building just really is not salvageable. You have to essentially remove all of the brick, jack up the building, replace all of the foundation, remove all of the roof framing, remove the roof, and then build it all back. So you're left with a pile of rubble to reconstruct. Um, we're not here today to discuss any of the zoning items that were addressed by pub public comment. That's not, uh, not here for, for comment. Um, and I'd also like to say that we're willing to work with the community and the residents to build back exactly what looks like it does here today. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is that we just simply want to provide a well, sound, safe building for residents and occupants to occupy. Um, and with that, I don't have any further comments. I will ask if Dr. Wisner has any comments or if uh, Mr. Wilkes has any comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It looks like, um, David, you could unmute Dr. Wisner. Yeah, um, I asked to unmute. Let me see. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, like, like, uh, Lindsay reiterated, it is, uh, you know, this is not, uh, us fighting to change the architectural fabric of, of Moreland. We absolutely, I mean, I own three properties here. They are not three commercial properties. There is a residential property. So uh, I appreciate Mr. Smith's comments, but he's, he's incorrect. Um, so, you know, there, there is no violation of any of, any of the zoning laws or, or the codes, um, but it was. I went into this with every intention to rehab this building. When we got down to the bones of it, I brought professionals in to take a look at it and they determined it could not be done. After the denial last time by the board, I went back to my professionals and said, okay, how can we fix this? You know, how can we make this building work for us? It's not physically possible to do it without removing the brick because it's not tied to the structure. So <clears throat> essentially we're left with not an argument against what we want to put back, uh, you know, I. I I can build another brick building that looks just like this one. I just can't utilize this building because it is not salvageable. Um, and, you know, to talk to Mr. Meek's points uh, as far as my reinforcing and, you know, and, and what I've done since 2017, 2018, um, I've been told by my professionals and my contractors that we can't repair the roof. We can't do all of the work that needs to be done to rehab this building or even improve the structure for that matter because it all ties together. And so I've got my hands tied with this building where I don't have an option to utilize the existing structure. I am happy to put back a structure 
that fits perfectly or looks identical to this. I need function for this building and this building does not function and it's not possible to make it function uh, in the condition it's in. This is the condition I inherited this building in. There was a hoarder who lived there. She was a shut-in. She was 93 years old. Finally, the, the ambulance and the police showed up and she had been passed out on her kitchen floor, dehydrated for three days and was finally moved out to family. When the family came to uh, you know, pull belongings and, and basically shore up the building, it was dumpster after dumpster after dumpster of personal belongings. So, you know, it, this building has been in this condition for years and I absolutely had every intention of renovating and, and uh, keeping the existing structure and it's just not possible. So I really ask you guys to consider, you know, I, I don't have an option moving forward if we're not allowed to demolish, even if there's a ruling that says I need to put back the same building, it's just not physically possible to use the structure that's there now. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the applicant team? Okay. Mr. Wilkes. Anything else? Uh, I think what Jay and Lindsay have said is perfectly describes the situation. And, um, you know, to speak to the building official uh, comments, um, you know, the foundation is undersized and failing. That's the most critical portion of the building right now to repair it, you know, to repair it. I don't, I don't know how you would do it other than what we've talked about already. You know, the, the brick veneer has to come off. The, the temporary shoring has to go in to elevate the house. We put in new foundations and we do these all the time downtown. You know, that's the kind of Kind of work that we do a lot of is, is the houses are basically all the cladding's taken off. They're shored up from the foundation up and then they're recladded with uh, traditional materials to try to match what was there originally. And everything that can be saved is saved. This house, the, the materials are just dimensional lumber that you find in any other house. There's just nothing special about it. Um, and the structure was built improperly to begin with it's it's amazing that it survived this long to be honest um, and if we do have a major storm or if we do have a major seismic event a lot of these homes and this one in particular will have major damage um, and we want to make sure there's nobody in there when that happens okay thank you with that um, all discussion is closed with the exception of within the board members um so board thoughts and or a motion uh erica this is andy smith um i'd like to make a motion of denial based on staff comment number one thank you andy we have a motion for denial based on staff comment number one is there a second does jeff have a second we have Jeff Johnson seconding the motion. I will now call roll. Dinos. Dinos, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Yes, and Dinos votes yay in favor. And may I, may I make a quick comment, please, Erica? Or is it inappropriate at this point? Uh, let me finish calling roll and then I would love your comment. That's thank okay. You. Thank you. Aaron? Uh, yes, in favor. Okay, thank you. Um, and same for me, yes, in favor. Okay, Dinos, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to just say very quickly that um, this has obviously been a very difficult exercise for every board member here. And I think that when we look at the conditions upon which we're having to, to, to really construct our decision, we look seriously at what constitutes Section 54 of 224 with the Savannah um, Highway overlay and the success that the ABD has had, especially in recognition of the South Carolina Association of Planning. Um, but I think the key issue is, is, is just the one condition upon which we are really subject to study very carefully, and that is 54 224. 
um, st stipulating that existing buildings shall be retained unless deemed structurally unsound by the chief building official, which is a third party unofficial member. And considering the fact that he has not seen, deemed this building um, structurally unsound, uh, I felt compelled to support the motion for denial. Thank you. Thank you, Dinos, and I appreciate that explanation. Thank you all for your time. We really do appreciate it. Um, with that, we will move on to item number two. Southwest corner of Beast Ferry Road and Sanders Road requesting conceptual approval for a multi new multifamily development with 358 units and seven buildings. David, if you could go through the overview if you have one. Sure. Can you one second just to let a few people in? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, so the next project on the agenda is Bees Ferry at Sanders Road. Um, this is a multifamily development with seven buildings. Um, give me one second. So here's the uh, location of the property and a closer view um, at the intersection of Sanders and Bees Ferry. Mm. Um, this is a multifamily development with 358 units in seven buildings. So um, this is at, I'm sorry, this is at the intersection of Sanders and Bees Ferry. And then this is looking um, west on Bees Ferry and the properties to the left. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian Riley. Are you the first person to speak, Brian? Yes, sir. Thank you, David. Good evening, Madam, Madam Chair and fellow board members. I'm Brian Riley with Thomas and Hutton. Um, thank you in advance for your time tonight. I would like to start. Is it possible to request five additional minutes to the presentation? No problem, Brian. Thank you. Um, I'm joined tonight uh, with fellow team members here. I've got John Winters representing the landscape architecture side. And I've also got Will Cox with me on the civil side at Thomas and Hutton. We also have the ownership team, Davis Development, uh, Lance Cherno, Christy Nalapoon, and Fred Hazel. And the architecture team, GLA, Brian Kempton, and Zach Kaufman. Um, prior to, I'm going to start, uh, prior to going into the site plan, I want to turn it over to Lance real quick just to give a intro on the ownership side. And I apologize, I see I was just allowed in and I, am I, I'm assuming I'm unmuted at this point? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful, well, we really appreciate this opportunity. My name is Lance Cherno, I'm with my colleagues, Fred and Christy, and we really appreciate this opportunity to present to the board. This will be our third project um, where we will be presenting to DRB and we really appreciate the back and forth and the enhancement that can occur through this collaborative process. The other two projects were Satori West Ashley, which has just broken ground down the street, and another one, Verdier, which uh, is practically across the street from this project. Uh, for this project, we've teamed up with Thomas and Hutton, and we've uh, been led down the way with, with Brian Riley, and we've been working uh, with staff uh, for multiple, multiple months uh, on this site plan to preserve as much open space and as many trees as we possibly can. And we're very excited to be here with our team, as Brian said, with Thomas and Hutton and GLA Architects to present this project. And recognizing how valuable everyone's time is, I'm gonna defer and, and let the experts start talking about the plan. Thanks, Lance. Um, okay, as David mentioned, we're on the Southwest corner of Beast Ferry and Sanders Road. Um, we have about the project site is about 52 acres, 35 of it's upland. Um, go to the next slide, David. <clears throat> Currently, the site's wooded. It's a mixture of pines and hardwoods. Um, you can see the <clears throat> different street views from both Bees Ferry and Sanders Road. Um, generally, the, the site is relatively high compared 
to some surrounding areas. We're at elevation 10 to 14, NABD 88, and site flood zones are X and X shaded. Um, next side, slide, please. Okay, keep going to get to the uh, illustrative plan. There we go. Um, <clears throat> So, oh, Brian, um, um, I just added this slide uh, with the bigger text so the board could see the numbering of the buildings and how many floors. Um, okay. As the text that was here was too small to read. Gotcha. Well, thank, thank you very much for doing that. Um, <clears throat> well, while you got it on, we can stay on that slide we'll, since you did that real quick. Um, I was going to say that the site is there's a zoning boundary that splits the site. Um, the portion facing along uh, Bees Ferry Road is limited business, which allows four story units. And then the, the portion away from Bees Ferry Road closer to the um, transmission easement that bisects the site is uh, DR1F, which is limited to three story building. So that's, <clears throat> that's the uh, reason you see building 1,000 and 4,000 is three story is they fall within the DR1F zoning district while the other buildings fall within the limited business district. Um, can you go back to the illustrative? There you go. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> we have two primary entrances into the site, main being off of Bees Ferry Road, that'll like that'll be a right in, right out, just due to the median restriction there. Um, <clears throat> as you come into the site, you're welcomed by the clubhouse and leasing center with the, um, so we wanted to provide a sense of arrival there. And that, that came through collaboration, not only with uh, Eric Schultz and city TRC staff, but uh, David was involved in that discussion as well. And we, we, we thought that was a great idea. Um, the secondary entrance is off of Sanders Road down in the page. Yeah, thank you. Um, you'll notice that road that comes off of Sanders kind of dies into nothing to the left. There's an existing residential development that is under construction there um, that had a, has a public city road that'll be, that will terminate at our property line. So we will pick that public road up and continue it out to city or Sanders Boulevard or Sanders Drive. That will be a city public right of way to that neighborhood. And then the, the drive that comes off of it will be a private drive into this development. Um, <clears throat> another unique aspect of coordinating with staff on this site plan was as you follow that secondary entrance up through the power easement, it kind of comes on an angle. Um, as you arrive right there in that green open space, there's a very uh, beautiful live oak. I think it's like 61 inches in diameter, but it's it's got great form. Um, it's a signature tree. And so we wanted to provide the secondary access with a sense of arrival there, celebrate that tree. Um, we've got some you know, open space all around it. We would have planned some hardscape activities there too, so that it can be a feature for the development. Um, the trees overall were a driving factor in the site plan that you see here before you. Um, as Lance mentioned, we spent a great deal of time surveying the trees, getting the trees graded by arborists, et cetera. We worked with city TRC staff, and again, David was involved in some of those discussions too on how to how to lay the site out. It was a challenge to avoid the trees. Um, we tried to <laughs> focus on providing, making sure that each building had some level of, of amenity, open space associated with it, um, and not just uh, parking lots on either side. So we, we focused on that. Um, I know that there <clears throat> may be some concern related to the size of the buildings, the length of the buildings. Um, you know, one thing that that does allow us to do on this site is aggregate the open space such that it's it can be larger, be more usable for activities. Um, and it also plays a role into working around the trees that we, we have on the site. Um, 
Go to the next slide, David. This is just a black and white of that illustrative line or illustrative plan. You, it has the zoning boundary on it, um, but again, it, it cuts through that building 1,000 and 4,000, which was the reason they were, yeah, that's it, David, thank you. <clears throat> and there on this plan, you can see the uh, adjacent single family down at Page South that the public road will connect to. Okay, next slide. The, uh, this is just a conceptual landscape plan that was included in the packet. Um, you know, the, the overall intent here is to, to provide and focus on a native plant material palette. And we'll also plan to try to enhance the, the existing grand trees, which are the colors you see on the plan. Um, and, you know, highlight those open spaces for the residents, for the benefit of the residents. I have John Winters with me again, who's landscape architect on the team. If there's any specific questions related to the landscape, we can certainly engage him. Uh, next slide. Okay, you can go to the next one, which I believe should bring up the architecture team and I'll tag out to uh, Brian Kempton with GLA. Um, Brian, can you hear us? You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Brian Kempton with the Hebrew Lewis Architects, and I'll describe the architecture for you. Um, this is our uh, streetscape elevations. As you can see from the photos below, the street, streetscape currently on both sides of the street is uh, full of trees, uh, no existing buildings or anything like that. So the proposed elevations um, on, this, on this screen have the trees removed so you can see what the buildings look like there. Um, but if you go to the next slide, we have uh, a perspective to give you a taste of what those buildings look like. That's between um, buildings two and three. And you can see there'll be a considerable tree buffer between the street and the existing trees. Um, The architecture that we are proposing here has um, light color scheme, lighter colored brick and board and batten siding and some lap siding inside the balconies. And then we have some large three foot overhangs with uh, big brackets, um, dark soffit and fascia, dark columns, dark railings. And, uh, you can see the uh, roof lines are popping, popping up and, and uh, uh, to create some visual interest. And we have the building in plan. When we get to those plans, you'll see it undulates in and out to um, kind of break down the scale of the bigger buildings that we have here. You can go to the next slide. And this is building uh, one, it has the amenity in it. Uh, it consists of leasing space, clubhouse, fitness on the first two floors there. And then um, it's also got uh, units at the other end of the building. Go to the next slide. And this is upper level for building 100. And you can see that all of our, uh, here you can see the ins and outs on the building kind of break down the scale of it. And um, all of our elevations at the ends of the building also have uh, wraparound balconies and large windows. So um, no blank or boring elevations uh, here. You can go to the next slide. 
this is the second level of that building 1000 we have some double height spaces in the amenity area and some of the bigger buildings like the club uh, bigger rooms rather like the club and the fitness and the main leasing entry uh, next slide please this is building 2000 um, most of the buildings are about this size and you can see we have garages in all of them and we have an inboard trash location and elevator in each building. Um, the rest of the buildings are similar in plan to this, except if you want to flip through to um, building six is going to have a firewall due to the size of the building. So buildings one, six, and seven are the larger buildings and they have a, a firewall due to the, the size. I'm sorry, did you want me to jump forward to 6,000? Where I just I'm, did? Yep, uh, you can see the firewall there located in building 6,000. Mm -hmm. And um, so buildings one, six, and seven have the firewall. They're the larger buildings. But other than that, the they all have garages, they all have elevators, trash room inside the building. So you can go to the next slide, please. I, I jumped forward to building 6,000, if that's okay. Yep, that's good. All, all the buildings are, are very, very similar. So in interest of time, we can, we can jump through the building plans and go right to the elevations. All right, and here's the elevations for building one. This is the one that has the amenity area in it. You can see we have um, proposed shed dormer uh, pop-ups here. And we also have some uh, hip, hip roof, raised hip roofs and um, all the ups and downs in the roof and the ins and out on the plan help break down these large buildings so that they have good scale and proportion. And we have, um, again, the color scheme is, is light brick, light board and batten and lap siding, and then darker columns, railings, brackets, uh, soffit and fascia at the top. And this, this is one of building one and building four are the three story and the rest of the buildings are four story. You can flip through, they're all pretty similar. You can see on the, uh, corner balconies that wrap around, uh, nice elevations on the end as well, plenty of windows and balconies. So we take advantage of all the nice views and trees on the site. And all, the, all these elevations are very similar, so you can proceed through. We are at a little over 15 minutes, um, which is okay. Just if you could be cognizant and start wrapping up, if that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we're just about done. Uh, all, all these elevations are very similar. I think we just have a couple of small buildings at the end. David, if you don't mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, here we have our maintenance building. Uh, it's in a similar style architecture with um, the brick and the batten siding, carriage style doors uh, to complement the big buildings. And you can flip it on. This is our mail kiosk plan and mail kiosk elevations with similar elevations, brick and light colored batten. And that's it for the architecture. Thank you. Anything else from the applicant team? I don't think so. Right. Thank you. Thank you. With that, do we have any uh, questions from the board? 
I had one quick one. Um, Brian, the pond, is that size just for this development? It seemed rather large. I wasn't sure if it was. <laughs> it it is rather large. Uh, no, yes, it is for this, just this development, and it's due to the Church Creek drainage okay. basin requirements. For what, 100% ratio? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we want to do with that large pond and as you can see we did try to really use it as an amenity and so you see that we our plan is to have a walking path that circles the entire pond and connects to the various units to really create a great amenity you know for the residents with a just an unbelievable amount of nature that they'll be able to enjoy and to save the trees that were located in that area. You see, we kind of almost created islands for the trees to really kind of give that extra enhancement for our residents. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Yes, this is Erin. I just had a quick question while we're on this page. Um, at the top corner where y'all call out that grass paved drive, is that for fire access or what's the, what is that exactly? Cor <clears throat> correct, that, that would be uh, fire access to get to the rear of the to have the appropriate coverage to the rear of that building. Okay, great. Um, I think that was my, oh, and I had one other question um, where you had the uh, amenity area and the secondary amenity area called out and then above the secondary amenity area, what is that between buildings? Like there's like a small thing, is that another amenity up? If you move oh. up, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hi, this is John Winters with Thompson Hutton. Yes, that'd be a secondary amenity that would have some, um, you know, potential hammock garden, outdoor grill. Um, we're still kind of trying to balance out between these two spaces what would work best, but um, there's a great uh, live oak tree there that we were trying to utilize. Yeah, I was talking just above that. There looks like another area that right there. Yes, that's the one I was referring to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So that there, there's two existing trees uh, that are kind of offset by each other. Yep, one's there and there that we were trying to okay. utilize that space and. and... Um, Madam Chair, I have, this is Dinos. May I ask a couple of questions? Please, we're in question, the question um, time, so go ahead. Um, from a parking standpoint, are you um, meeting zoning, exceeding zoning? What? Um, do you see as far as your parking count? Um, we are we are meeting zoning and we are exceeding zoning. We're right. also meeting the the ratios that um, these these type developments demand. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, if, if they can't be parked, they will not be successful. So, how many parking spaces beyond zoning are you um, providing? Um, Go to the next slide, David. Um, I calculated 109 spaces over what zoning requires. Does that sound right? That may be right. Wow. Um, um, is this so, a, a program requirement? Is this a, um, and are all, let me ask you this, the 109 spaces that are over zoning, are they all hard paved? Correct. Well, <clears throat> most of them are surface parking. There are garage spaces that are factored into that. That total. Well, when you well. say surface parking, pavement. Correct. Okay. Um, the other question that I have kind of deals with the orientation of the buildings as it relates to the pond, and I see that there's an endeavor to try to addressed the, um, uh, the pond. I was just curious about what appears to be a such, and I wish I could point directly to it, but I, I don't know what building that is. Um, it's the one to the left of 7,000, I believe. Yes, that one right there. Um, was there any study on bringing more of the buildings in conjunction with a visual of the pond as opposed to the separation of all the parking? Uh, well, that, you know, the, the pond is segregated from the site due to that power transmission easement. Um, right, but I mean, so, as far as flipping 
I mean, there are 109 additional parking spaces. Um, I'm struggling with what's dictating the, the site planning right now. Um, are, are, you, are you suggesting that zoning is the, the, the zoning ratio of parking is that far out of proportion to the demand and need of the complex? Um, I might I might ask Lance to speak to the ratios that that they see on a national level. Sure. Based on yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the things that you know, drives resident retention, as you can imagine, is close proximity to your unit when it's dark and raining. And our unit mix tends to trend a little bit more to the actually a lot more to the two and three bedroom units. And so you'll see this mix. Um, I don't have the exact mix in front of me, but is going to have 50% plus two bedrooms. I think it has around 10 to 15% three bedrooms. So that's going to drive our unit count, or excuse me, our need for parking as compared to say a apartment community that has 70% one bedrooms and 30% two bedrooms. You know, that unit mix is going to drive the need for garage, excuse me, for parking to be a little bit less. We tend with our unit mix to trend to about a 1.7 to 1.8 spaces per unit to meet the needs and demands of the residents. We would love to design less. Um, obviously, the more parking, it's more cost to the extent that, you know, we could do, I'll say, one and a half spaces, uh, you know, per unit. That would financially benefit us, but what we've recognized throughout our portfolio that about a 1.7 to 1.8 with the unit mix that we've presented here is, is where we are. And then in terms of your question on the site planning choices, as it relates to that one building, at, at one point that building was kind of where you had suggested and in the effort to save that the one really beautiful live oak that you see uh, identified immediately adjacent to it and still provide, provide for the appropriate uh, fire circulation and traffic circulation, you know, that was where that site planning choice came from, was all in an effort to really make that tree, um, you know, pop and, and stick out and really be a real feature for the community. I, I've got one. Uh, question that's kind of continuing from this. Um, maybe if you said this, I, I apologize. Um, do the parking, uh, sorry, do the garage spaces count towards that total count? And how many garage spaces do you have? Um, the garage spaces you know, do count, the, the tandems do not, which would be the driveways in front of them, but the drive spaces do count and are included in that 42 parking. Garage there are 42 garages. 42. <laughs> and they do count towards that uh, parking ratio. Thank you. For reference, the zoning code is 1.5 per unit. Mm -hmm. That's irrespective, Brian, right, of whatever the unit mix is? Right, right, yeah, it doesn't take into account zoning or unit mixture. Yeah, and so other jurisdictions, um, sir, you know, will really, their, their parking ratios will be based on bedrooms as compared to just straight unit. And so, you know, our, our parking is really reflecting that unit mix. This is Aaron again, while we're on parking, this is kind of a, a detail, so it might be too fine grain for question for now, but I can't help but ask um, that there's like that one little thumb of parking that sticks into the easement, is there? any kind of reason for that? Or it just, it's hard not to comment on that um, looking at the plan. Yeah, um, once again, it was to try to meet the, the parking needs that, as we saw them as typical for a, a community uh, with this unit count and with this unit mix. Mm -hmm. Trust, it, it would be a lot less expensive and we wouldn't have to go talk to the electrical company about having to build under there. If we could have, uh, in our mind, from a marketing standpoint, if we could avoid it, that would be preferred because it is not, there's a lot of coordination to obviously do that. But once again, our, our focus is truly customer 
service and trying to make the best resident experience we can and having sufficient parking is important for that purpose. And to keep the fire marshal happy so we don't have people parking on curbs and whatnot. That's extremely important. Any other questions? Um, the retail space that you have in, is that building 1000? I'm sorry, it's the main building as you come in. Um, how, what do you see in there as far as you mentioned that that was space was appropriate for retail? No, no, it's not. It's, it's not retail space. That is the that is our club facility. So our club facility and our leasing facility will have amenities such as the, a coffee station for our residents, um, the club room, business office, center. business center. Uh, it'll have a fitness center, um, you know, guest suites. It, it's that's more programmatic just for the apartments. It is not commercial retail. Okay. When you look at the elevations and one of the things that we were talking about um, as you were flipping through, uh, how um, can you talk about the screening and the mechanical units? How are you right. doing that? Yes, the way we're doing that now is we've taken the option and the approach of taking all of the units off of the ground. We used to obviously have the sea of H HVAC units on the ground around the, uh, the perimeter of the bottom We've elected to take those to the roof and we've designed those and put those inside of roof wells, which are screened and they're turned to the interior of the, of the project and they're down inside um, such that all the HVAC units are there. It enhances our landscaping and curb appeal around the buildings and just kind of makes those go away. And so we found that a great option for our communities instead of the sea of, of condensing units. Can you explain the screening? Uh, I'm, I'm trying, I there, don't there are, see it. There are wells, and in fact, Brian uh, with GLA may be able to, to better assist me, but they're actually framed wells that drop down into the roof. So if you saw a pitch roof coming down, the roof will pitch, there'll be a break down in, and there's actually a well created down inside the roof that they, will, they are housed such that they're down inside of a well inside of that pitched roof. And I don't know if, if Brian, there's a, an opportunity here to reflect that. Yeah, and I apologize, just, I should have described that uh, when we were going through the, the buildings, but yes, it's it's a mansard style roof. So the, the shingles go up and they rise up above the, the level of the roof deck where the condensers are sitting such that they they uh, totally screen them from view. And, and I believe that this is the same uh, system we use at the project with this breaking S Satori West. Satori West Ashley is using the same system of the roofs for the HVAC as well. And it actually requires us having to put uh, roof drains in there. Uh, so otherwise it would fill up with water. But uh, it, it basically creates creates a recessed roof well that all those condensers are in, and then they're out of view. Mm -hmm. And to the extent necessary, we can provide a greater level of detail of that actual well as a sub drawing, if necessary, so that you can see uh, see how it how it how it works. Thank you. That'd be helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. This is Jeff. I've got a couple questions. Um, one is site related, but we can stay on these building elevations. I think that's important. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. <clears throat> um, just kind of curious, Brian, you talked about these architectural elements as if they were just that elements. And just kind of curious if you were to say and there was a particular influence that drove this architectural style, um, what would those influences be? Um, it's kind of like a modern craftsman style, if I had to point to something. But, um, you know, with the shed roof, large overhang, and, and, and large brackets, that, that's what I would say. It's, a, it's an interesting predicament, and you talked about the streetscape 
uh, that there is no buildings, and that is true. We we are creating the streetscape. We are creating the context, and it's important to reflect our geographical and regional context. Um, my other question is relative to, well, on this elevation here, can you, where your hand is, I think, David, can you describe what that gray box is on the roof in between column line? Uh, I can't tell what those column lines are. That's yes, the well. For the That's the roof well, yes, sir. Okay, so is this is that just a graphical thing? So we're not really supposed to see a gray box there, or what? What's happening? No, the, uh, you're basically seeing the back wall of the roof well, and um, it would be painted in a dark color so that it blends with the roof. Ah, so mechanical units would sit up there. They would be down in in there, but you're you are seeing the back wall of that roof well beyond. Okay. I've seen a couple of different strategies for that. This is this one's interesting. This, this is the one that you drive into, right, on access from Bees Ferry, is that correct, this building? Yes. So as you're driving up, you would see this cut through the roof and see the oh, back no. side of a service. No. This is the building, but the, the roof well would be on the back side. Ah. Uh. So you would see the north elevation there. Yeah, those okay. are always oriented inward to the community, away from road views, to the extent possible. I got you. North north elevation faces Bees Ferry. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, I have a, a similar question to um, Brian's team at Thomas and Hutton in terms of the site development. If we can jump back over to the site plan. Uh, again, the same question. We, I've heard a lot about site um, elements, zoning districts and trees that you want to save, but just kind of curious to hear your thoughts about what drove the building locations, where they were, uh, parking configurations and flow of the site. Um, sure. Uh, well, at first, we went through several iterations, um, and the trees, and I'm not, I mean, the, the trees ended up being a significant driver. Um, we've also played around with the idea of, of maybe parking was a, against the Bees Ferry undisturbed buffer, um, just knowing the opaqueness of that and not really, the building's not truly being on Bees Ferry. Um, however, that, I don't think that was the desire of, of city staff. So the buildings along Beast Ferry are obviously there for that reason. Um, and then, you know, we were limited to our site access on Beast Ferry Road. That, in, that, that area was limited to where we could actually get the access with DOT. Um, so we wanted to provide that sense of arrival at building one so that you know that kind of nailed down that building and then the the other buildings the other three buildings were generally placed to provide some level of open space or amenity for for the residents of each of those buildings the one in the center the smaller building four you know we, we got it up against the wetland um, with the open space behind it and then again the the two on the right side of the page the l-shaped you know, six and five, or I can't see the numbers, but um, four and seven. These are, that, yeah, six and five. I'm yeah, sorry. actually six and seven on the right. Yeah. But um, you know those those ended up being placed primarily just because of the tree locations and and that big open space that the existing trees generated, um, and that just that became through some coordination directly with the city TRC staff and planning staff on how to navigate around those trees. And we saw it as a good opportunity to provide that large expansive open space to the benefit of all the residents. And so, I mean, it, it kind of organically grew just due to those various items. And then a follow-up question, everything that's 
uh, in this dark, dark kind of olive green? Is that wetland? Is that off limits that's Correct. left? Correct. <clears throat> Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions from the board? Okay, with none, we will enter the public comment period. Um, we only have one person registered to speak, Katie Zimmerman. Hey there, how are y'all? Good, thank you. Good to see. It. Sorry that you've had to hear from me so much over the past few weeks. Um, I uh, I just wanted to um, comment uh, and ask um, for something to be considered. Um, we just as a quick background, we have been working with um, a lot of the neighbors nearby, as well as the city of Charleston um, and Senator Sin. Uh, and Charleston County on um, trying to get safe access to the schools at the other end of Sanders Road. To that end, um, more than 40 of us came together um, and applied for county money to put in a multi-use path from Half Shell Lane to the entrance of the schools um, because there is an abundance of children who even during COVID are, are walking and biking. and once things kind of get back to closer to normal, um, we know that number will skyrocket. Um, so we, um, we learned through that process that a lot of the neighbors would very much like to see a multi-use path along the entirety of Sanders. And I know that there are some, some barriers to that, but I wanted to ask, um, y'all tonight, if you would consider, I, I know you have a sidewalk included in your site design on Sanders Road. I wanted to ask if you would consider widening that sidewalk, if you can get it to a multi-use path, that would be ideal, but as wide as you're able to accommodate so that we can get um, the, uh, everybody, but in particular, the, the children who are coming to and from the schools, um, a safe space to, to go as we sort of try to piecemeal this path along Sanders Road. It would also be a wonderful connection to the existing multi-use path that is already on Beast Ferry Road. So thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, we have a, a number of submitted letters and emails. Um, however, I think all of them um, just about are commenting on items that are not in our purview. Um, therefore, I will not specifically read. Um, all of them, but they are all relating to traffic and flooding, which again is not our purview. But for the record, I will read names and whenever addresses are provided. And then if there, I think I have a, one or two sentences marked in all of them um, total that were not totally outside of our purview that I'll cover. Um, first one is Alana Ronquist. Second is Caroline Noble, 657 past Dallum Court. The next is Sharice Cassetta in Grand Oaks. Charles Gwaltney. Cher Clayton. Dr. Clarice Hautschlitt. Daniel Gracie, 260 Gazania Way. Gazania Way. Danielle Hoffman, 3131 Moonlight Drive. Dean O'Brien, 3006 Lazarette Lane. Jamie Ennis. Jennifer Kleiner, 851 Bibbery Court. Jennifer Schroeder. John Holter, 2614 Dweller Court. Lieutenant Colonel John Milner, 736 Hunt Club Run. LaDawn Page, 886 Hunt Club Run. 
Laura Langston, 2823 Joby Drive. Linda Housley, homeowner and resident in Bolton's Landing. Um, in addition to the items not in our purview, she does um, ask us to defer until public notice is available to those residents that live in surrounding communities. Um, that she only learned of the item today, hours before the meeting. And to defer this plan until more adequate notice can be given to these very neighborhoods. Um, Linda and Ron Call. Marie Lazinski. Melanie Patino, 3120 Moonlight Drive. Melon Moore. Olga Zeta, who lives in Hamilton Grove subdivision. Pamela Ingram, 1036 Tyron Circle. Robert Frederick. Shauna Terhark in Bolton's Landing resident. And Tim Mays. So with that, that concludes the public comment portion of our meeting. David, if you could please go over staff comments. Ma Madam Chair, may I ask you a question? Were, sure. were all of those names that you were just, was, were they, I'm, I must have missed this, uh, were they in favor of the application, opposed to the application? All opposed, um, I'd say the majority or beyond the majority, almost everything was traffic related with a okay. little bit of flooding mixed in, which we are not allowed to discuss since it's not our purview. Gotcha, thank you, ma'am. Sure. Okay, thank you, Erica. This is David. Uh, staff comments for Bees Ferry and Sanders Road. Uh, staff observations. Um, the height and scale mass of this project seems to be larger than the other projects in the vicinity, most of which are smaller buildings and two to three story developments. Uh, the buildings have a low country feel with the large overhangs, brackets, and shed roofs. Uh, the tall windows are also a nice touch. <clears throat> The applicants are providing a good amount of trails, especially on the south portion of around the pond. The landscape palette is off to a good start. The staff worked with the applicants on the site plan during TRC and suggested reducing the parking lot frontage along Beast Ferry and getting the buildings up along Beast Ferry, which they have done. Um, <clears throat> staff comment number one. The staff would like to see the mass of the fa and facade of the long buildings broken up or additionally articulated, uh, consider varying heights on the buildings or a um, mix of four, three stories on buildings. Uh, the longest proposed building, uh, 7,000, is uh, 354 feet long and four stories. Uh, we ask that the applicant provide a precedent imagery of this building size that's been used in the area. Uh, staff comment two, there is an architectural element with a flat roof in the middle of the northeast elevation. Well, let me um, go down to where that is. A second. Um, it's, it's in the middle of um, mm -hmm. several of the buildings. Is that um, a mechanical well? Uh, no, I think this is just a architectural oh, feature. Sorry. Yeah, yes. this. Uh, projects out a little bit from the building um, and then has this flat roof, um, almost like a tower feature. But we felt that it seems out of scale with the size of the building, it should be more pronounced. Um, number three, there's a large use of storefront systems and what appears to be fixed glass on the buildings. Uh, being completely residential, the field administration should reflect this use. Um, number four, uh, sheet A5.2, which is building 2000, and on building 3000, there's, oh, I'm sorry, this is a repeat of what I just said here. We can scratch um, that item, actually. Um, it's just a repeat of the uh, staff comment number two, I apologize. Uh, staff comment five, the main entry of the building 1000 is what one sees when first entering the property. This should be more special, possibly a tower feature. Um, number six, graphically, the male kiosk elevations 
do not display correctly. We cannot see the building details. Um, I think it's just a, a graphic mistake. Uh, make the line weights heavier and um, more legible. Uh, staff comment number seven. Uh, the mail kiosk and maintenance building elevations should be labeled per the direction the elevation faces, uh, not right and left elevation. All the floor planes have north arrows, which are incorrect. We ask that you keep the north arrows, but uh, correct the direction. On uh, number nine, please include north arrows on all site plans, um, such as the illustrative site plan. Uh, number 10, many of the notes provided on the drawings are too small to read. You can make them a little larger, darker. Number 11, uh, label the 50 foot buffer along these ferry. Uh, staff does recommend deferral for height scale mass. Uh, but I would like to go on. Uh, we have further staff comments uh, that uh, we feel could be addressed by preliminary review. Um, uh, staff comment number 12, staff requests that the trail system be expanded to go around the north and east sides of the building as well. The west property line buffer looks too narrow to include a trail, so that's okay. Uh, number 13, where the entry drive comes in into the site off Saunders Road, the trail is right up against the road. Uh, please provide a green planting strip between the road and the trail, minimum three feet. Uh, number 14, uh, the path that goes around the pond might be better if it was pulled away from the pond edge to make way for pond edge plantings. And also if the trail meandered some along the pond edge, I think that would be nicer. Uh, number 15, staff is concerned about the amount of sod being specified in the parking lot islands that are surrounded by a raised curb, which makes it difficult for mower access. Study making these long parking lot islands depressed water collectors with native plant rain gardens. Uh, even if not depressed water collectors, native grasses such as um, uh, uh, native grasses and such are suggested over uh, lawn sod. Uh, number 16 staff questions if more grand trees could be saved by reconfiguring the pond. We also question the health of the trees that will be left on an island in the pond. Uh, study expanding the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, study expanding the pond to extend under the power lines then save more grand trees and not to create islands in the ponds for the trees. Uh, number 17, expand the plantings to the pond edge, include some native shrub groupings. Number 18, increase the number of trees and shrubs specified uh, in this project. The use of mostly uh, native plants is also encouraged. Um, number 19, the applicant is providing 109 parking spaces over what zoning requires for parking. Uh, staff asks this, for this number to be reduced and more green space added internally. Uh, start by removing the dead end parking spur that is under the power lines, which looks odd and is far away from the buildings, as well as the dead end parking close to Dee's Ferry. Uh, number 20, DRB staff suggests that the pervious pavers be provided somewhere on the site. And we ask that this uh, square footage of pavers provided be the same as the square footage of the number of parking spaces that you go over what zoning requires. Number 21, provide decorative pavers at the main entry. And number 22, staff supports that the buffer along Vs Ferry Road is protected and being added to with plantings. Uh, please also add some evergreens, such as red cedars to the buffer. 23, the sidewalk along the road that leads to Saunders Road should be extended all the way to Saunders. I'm sorry, Sanders Road. Um, it stops just shy of getting to Sanders Road. Uh, number 24, at the maintenance and mail kiosk buildings, the proportions of brick to siding on the exterior walls is one-to-one. -one. Um, a proportion that relies on rules of thirds would be more successful. <clears throat> uh, number 25, clearly indicate where roof equipment wells are located on the side view and provide um, a graphic from the street level for um, uh, just as proof that they will be visible from the ground. Um, uh, so that, that is it for staff comments. Thank you, David. Did the applicant team have any responses? 
um, or clarifications to public comment or city staff comments? Uh, one, one comment, um, the power line easement does not allow the expansion of the pond to go under the power line easement. We did research that. And thank you. And to the extent that the, there is a deferral, we can explore the two parking areas, which which staff has highlighted. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, this is Brian. I would like to add, you know, that the comments that David read related to being addressed at the preliminary level, which I think he kind of drew a line in those last 10 or 12, were obviously things we can address moving forward. Um, that is correct on the pond. The tree islands in the pond, we did make those islands are, I think, 25% larger than the protected required protected zone by city ordinance. And that came with the recommendation of Mr. Eric Schultz. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're hopeful that those are, those are um, adequate. And in response to Ms. Zimmerman, we will, there are challenges along uh, Sanders Road related to availability and uh, road shoulder to construct the sidewalk, as you probably know, but we'll certainly um, take your request under consideration as we move forward and see what we can, we can do there. Okay, thank you. We are now in board discussion and a and or a motion. Madam Chair, may, may, this is Dinos. May I ask, I'm sorry, the applicant a question that I meant. I know you're smiling at me. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with Sander Road, Sanders Road and the, and the neighborhood that is back there. It's predominantly low income African-American families. Has there been any attempt to address this development with that neighborhood? Have you met with the neighbors? We have not met with any neighbors. Okay. Oh, last Lance, have you met with any? Um, we have not. I do not know whether or not the current owner of the property and his team you know, during this long process of rezoning and the like did so at that point in time. Okay. The other question is a, is an item, I guess, for David, uh, if I may ask, and, and maybe Tori as well. Um, the, can you explain to the board what authority um, or what impact could the board have if uh, the board felt, if DRB felt that a lower height along Beast Ferry Road would be more appropriate with the taller buildings um, to the rear on the DR1, or I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what the zoning is. Do we have the ability to, for, to make that recommendation? Um, as it was explained to me earlier today by Eric Schultz, the zoning doesn't allow for um, four story on the back portion of the site. Right. Now right. the buildings along Beast Ferry um, are zoned that it allows up to 55 feet, which is four stories, but they could go down to three stories. But does the board, and understanding that, does the board have any influence on BZA zoning? If we sent back a recommendation that uh, based upon the context and scale of this property and particularly in the area, that um, the board feels that a um, uh, uh, three-story buildings along Beast Ferry would be more appropriate with four stories, much more appropriate considering the buffering of those buildings toward the rear of the property. Um, I believe so, but I would feel more comfortable saying I, I would need to check on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess since I've opened my big mouth, maybe I can finish up some items that, um, uh, could you go back to the site plan for a moment, David? And by the way, um, something that I failed to say last application and I did not want to forget on this application is um, 
high compliments to staff for extremely comprehensive and well-written notes and, and recommendations. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, in this regard. Um, there was a comment about the massing of the buildings and, and you know, we dealt with this previously on an affordable housing complex on Johns Island where just the, the, the scale and massing and when I hear that building 7,000 is 354 feet in length, there, there's really great value in the interstitial space that can exist between um, smaller groupings of buildings. And, and I too feel if I read staff's comments appropriately that the scale of the buildings are very large and could probably benefit greatly by reducing the, the scale of, of each individual down um, uh, to, to a smaller unit, to a smaller complex. Um, the other issue is I think along the lines that again, staff was mentioning 109 parking spaces um, are extensive. If, if there are 109, I think that there is a policy that the board has followed in the past past that um, anything over the zoning requirement would be soft parking. And one of the things that um, I certainly hope that um, would be uh, again followed through to minimize the extent of hard pavement as it relates to the overall um, uh, site and its scale. Uh, this is this is going to sound like a diss against civil engineers. Forgive me, it's not intended that way, um, Madam Chair or others. It, it, it the the site itself looks like it's completely structured around the parking and becomes very um, austere as a site itself. And my fellow board members may completely disagree, but boy, I would love to see a little bit more of a loose more loosely developed site that would provide a more organic feel. And there was issues and discussions about green space, um, but the rigidity of the site plan itself is um, contrary to an organic nature of the site development and particularly the site setting. And I'm very familiar with this site specifically. Um, the other issue is, is what I had mentioned early on, it would be so wonderful if the buildings, particularly those that have the capacity, not, on, and again, I can't read these numbers, but uh, the building that is adjacent to the wetlands facing the wetland, I believe that's looking south. Yes, sir. Thank building you. for 4,000. Similar to the manner in which it begins to orient itself to the pond and the wetlands, if, if, if the building to the right particularly as well could could begin to create that type of <coughs> relationship and association to um, some more of the more natural aspects of, of what's offered by the site. And the finally, final issue that um, I might just state on, on a global basis, and all of these are, are 30,000 foot dialogue before we can even get into the detail, is the to me the importance of, of, of the impact. Many of these residents in Sanders Road subdivision have been there, if not all their life, it's, it's generational as well. And um, I think that uh, garnering, um, if nothing more, their ability to have comment uh, on this would be a huge asset in regards to our endeavors as a public board to engage the community on a grander scale. So with that, I'll be quiet and turn it over to my other much smarter board members. That's not such a great segue into me, Valentinos. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm going to, to break with tradition and being, with Dinos's help of, of growth through positivity, I give you some positive comments up front. I, I do feel like the um, landscape palette as it's developing is, as staff says, is a very good start. Uh, I would encourage the 
filling out, especially in the tree species of, of um, that palette. Um, and I do want to reiterate Dinos's comment about staff's comments that um, they are very comprehensive and um, really leave are really exhaustive. And I think that the issues that are facing this project um, just in uh, my personal growth only goes so far, I guess. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I really feel like that this site and the site plan really is a very large ship of buildings amongst a sea of parking and they have very little cohesive um, in their nature to relate to each other, or at least it's not, I don't think demonstrated in the, in the plan view of the project. Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the mass of these buildings, um, the placement of the um, community structures. I, I just really feel like it needs another reiteration of, of study to create senses of arrival and, you know, staff comments on, on providing different forms of, of paving as you come in. That's a good study. Um, I just think, I just think these buildings are much too massive for the site and, and breaking down, creating smaller buildings that may be a little bit more agile on the site. Um, and breaking up this parking, this a massive parking, I think will just benefit the plan. Um, then the the only other, you know, like I said, staff has covered a great deal of, of the concerns I have. Um, the mass being the the largest pro problem I'm having with the project um, is. Um, Going back to the comments of the trees in the pond, I just, um, the live oaks may be okay. There's one red oak on one of those islands that's probably not going to survive. They just don't do so well when you start to grade out underneath them. Granted, you're giving it a larger area than it's required by the ordinance, but the ordinance really doesn't take into account the root structure of those, those trees and the red oaks just tend to not do so well in that situation. So uh, I understand you have a, a um, constraint with the ordinance and the, the drainage ordinance, but I would really take a look at some of those islands and some of those peninsulas and making sure you really give the, the root areas of those trees the room that they need. Um, and I guess I uh, kind of end with that. This is Jeff. I've got a, a couple of comments, and I'm not sure that they're cohesively um, organized, but they're, I'll, I'll, I'll share what I have. Um, I, I, I um, kind of definitely tend to agree with this, 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 the site plan, and it seems like it's build. It seems like it's kind of designed a parking lot, and then buildings are placed in the parking lot. And I would encourage you to kind of look at it in a different, the, the opposite way, the, the buildings first and then the parking comes second. Um, I have a hard time seeing the, the flow or, or concept. And I think that was kind of communicated with, with the answer to the question. I, part of me kind of wonder, can, can all these buildings be oriented up down? throughout the site so that there's a smaller impact on Bees Ferry. I mean, if the buildings are gonna be this long, then maybe they're turned so that they're marching soldiers perpendicular or yeah, perpendicular to Bees Ferry um, with some interesting spaces between might be one thing to study. Um, I would encourage that uh, if we're gonna put an access to uh, an entry or an entry element, then they, the building needs to better respond to that access 
the um, the way that it's articulated now on building one or one thousand, whichever one it's called, is a little a little puny. And I think Tori did a good job, of, or I'm sorry, David did a good job of um, communicating that in the comments. Now the length of the buildings is a is a concern, and when we look at what's been presented both in 2D elevations and the um, few 3D renderings, it's, it's really hard to get a sense of that length, um, really hard. Um, projects of this size, we typically require, I think the ordinance requires a 3D mass, um, a 3D model, which in the olden days was, was a wood model or paper model. And we've substituted 3D models for that uh, computer generated. And the ones that are provided aren't quite illustrative enough of the design. They are snippets and pieces and parts. But I think to communicate the, the design of this size, we need more, more renderings. Um, so we're gonna ask you to, to, to communicate the design more thoroughly with 3D representation. Um, <clears throat> along, along with that and the communication aspect, it, it's really challenging to read the drawings as they are with all the colors on them. I would, colors are fine, but I would submit black and white drawings so that they're e easier to read. Um, there, we had, as you know, several uh, confused direction on what the gray box meant on that, um, on the elevations, which was a mechanical well. And I think a black and white line drawing would have just communicated that idea better. Um, I, I also take a little bit of an issue with the scale of those drawings at 330 seconds are really hard to read as people have noted. Um, small elevations are fine, but what I've, what we've seen in the past is doing enlarged blow up. So not the entire building, just sections of the building that communicate the design. Um, it, it's really hard to understand that, that the design at this scale. Um, you know, I think David made a comment about the tower element. When I think of a tower element, I think that they're more dominant and it's hard to get dominant in a tower element on something that's 400 feet long, 350 feet long. So uh, I, I don't know if the towers are, are, are adequately doing what you want them to do. I like to embrace, if they were gonna have a long building, I like to embrace it as a long building. And I'm seeing a lot of tricks architecturally that are just disguising a very long building. Um, I would encourage you to minimize the ups and downs and the ins and outs and, and truly embrace the mass at which it is. And I, I think um, Dinos and Andy made the comment, if you made the building smaller, it's easier to grapple with the mass. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, I, th I think, I guess we've talked a lot about some positives, or maybe a little bit about positives on the site, but I'd like to share just a, a little bit of positives with the building. I think there's some, I think there's some good starting points here. I, I'm liking the brackets. I like the, how the corners of the buildings kind of erode. It sure would be nice to see some of those long buildings drop down and scale to maybe where the center portion is four stories and the ends get down to three stories. Um, you know, all, all in all, there's a lot of um, things that just need to be massaged. There's a few good points that I would encourage you to carry on over, but all, all in all, I think there's just a lot of things that need to be resolved. And, and a lot of this to me, it's taken back to a strong concept. If we can, if you start hanging your hat on concepts, then I think we can start to um, go along with you. But right now it's hard to see those concepts and hard to see a vision for the site other than we're trying to get a bunch of parking spaces and a bunch of units. Um, it's hard to accept this application as it's presented right now. Number one, it's hard to understand. Mm. May I just interject, David? Can you go back to the um, perspective from the Beast Ferry Road? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you know, when you look at this, you it begins to this, I think, and Jeff, I don't know how you feel, this begins to give a sense of what smaller building components can begin. And this is kind of what this seems to be presenting. Um, Andy has used in the past too, particularly on the ancillary buildings, the mail building, the maintenance facility. What is the term you use that buildings like that need, Andy? I mean, some attitude. Some attitude. I mean... Yep. Yeah. I, I I think those buildings and the manner that they're being presented really need so much more um, careful attention because those are actually very human scale structures too. Um, but I thought this perspective was particularly um, telling because it, it it's interesting that it's presented as small um, bits of buildings which are suggesting the aspect of uh, what smaller units could be. Uh, I, I think I do think it's very interesting that you know we've had this in a couple of projects where the three D image that was presented almost proves our point. You know, like this is the, you know what what we need. And as you say, is that this captures the smaller building that I think is informative. Mm -hmm. These little vignettes and are, are great um, that capture the character, but it doesn't capture the entire uh, design. Exactly. And, and I look Correct. at look and I look at the building on the right here, this is only maybe a third or maybe even a quarter of that entire building. So it's a little bit misleading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's attractive. There are some elements that are really attractive and designed well. But when I take those same elements and I move them, um, you know, repeat them four, five, six, seven times, is it does it have the same attractiveness? Mm -hmm. And th this is what I was talking about with three D representation. Mm -hmm. I think it's this and maybe one one other rendering that as you read, um, it's on the cover page. So I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable enough with the direction of this project with just two renderings. And, and not, not that we don't have the ability to judge 2D drawings, but even the 2D drawings are hard to read. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, I, on the floor plan, as we were talking about garages, I didn't even pick up that there were garages on the first floor. Mm -hmm. I think lab labeling those would be helpful in, in doing some sort of architectural site plan that would help to indicate what's going on from a paving strategy would help too. And to that end, as you're developing it, it seems like that's a lot of pavement up against the building for 30 to 40 feet. And, and when we get to that scale of detail, is that, is that the right thing to do? I would question. I mean, going back to your comment about the um, 3D renderings, doing something that's a, a bird, you know, just not of the building, directly of the building, but also of the site and seeing three dimensionally, you know, even in a bird's eye or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, roof height, you know, that helps communicate better the relationship of these buildings. I think that we're, we're asking to develop in the, in the plan. I think is 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 something that, that we're not getting out of this plan. Uh, I would say that you know as you develop these buildings, you know placing that in the site, in addition to giving us good character design, good character renderings of the building, I think will help communicate where you're going and and your concept. You know later. It's a it's a good point. It speaks to the quality of renderings. It's a great point, Andy. Um, you can convey a lot with a simple rendering. And th these are mm -hmm. nice, um, high quality renderings that are intended to show character. But I, I think we need to probably take a step or two back and say, show renderings that show design, um, design concept mm -hmm. in space between buildings. Yeah, they don't have to be this polished, publishable for this board. Although this, it's tricky because this board is also public. 
any information is publishable, I guess. Hmm. <clears throat> so tricky, tricky, but um, it's helpful to convey the design. I'm not, I'm not, it's hard to see the design being conveyed accurately in what we've been presented. That's tough. Um, may I pursue my original question to David for a moment? Um, Madam Chair, is it, sure. um, is it within our purview to, um, and I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but uh, to ask that the applicant with our DRB support, if it's so desired, go back to BZA zoning with a request that um, three-story structures might would be along Beast Ferry with four story structures further to the interior of the site. Um, I would I would need to look into that. Um, okay. I'm not sure what would be involved with that. It'd be a zoning change, I presume, for the uh, the portion that now states you can only get three stories on the interior of the site. It primarily is as a. Uh, I think it's BZA zoning that um, you would have to go back to, and uh, yeah, it would be a, a zoning a zoning variance with BZA zoning, just like you said, Dinos. I think you have a unique case that wouldn't set a precedent in this instance, based on the different zonings, based on the configuration of the site with the wetlands, the pond, the buffers. Mm -hmm. um, it's just is it what is in our purview, and are we allowed to? only suggest that or require that or um I don't know that that it, it and once again as Dino says this is totally you know off maybe off base but I don't think it's necessarily our our place to say you know this is what you need to pursue when it comes to the purview of another board um I, I do think that it's we should say we would support as a board if you were to ask for this. Um, we would provide support from our point of view. Um, and, you know, these are these are the things that we, we feel that are inappropriate for our um, our board and the, the problems we're having. And if you were to pursue a variance, we would support it, but you also need to come back and provide us a solution. You know, I would, I would agree with all, all of that, Andy. Mm -hmm. I would too, it's very well stated. And that it's a suggestion, but by no means a requirement, but you would, our support would be granted with that being the case. Um, I'd like to just point out, um, this is the, the, the boundary line for that zoning, the two zoning districts. So it divides this building and it, it also divides this building. So really these two buildings are the only two buildings that are required to be four stories. So any of the other buildings could be three story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, and this is something to discuss with Lee obviously, but I think that where you have two zoning districts that meet each other, and have a split zoning like this, there is an extension of that zone that the rules across that zoning for a certain certain area. It may not be that whole building, but that's just something to discuss with Lee. We've had a situation like that in the past on another project, and um, it, it's just it is tricky when you have a. Uh, a split like that and it's why I think the ordinance tries to avoid those sorts of situations where mm -hmm. you have uh, a split zoning on the same property mm -hmm. um, I, I mean I don't, I don't know what the answer is uh, I mean I, once again I think it's a suggestion to the applicant and the applicant has to pursue a, uh, an answer knowing that we would support a variance in that mm -hmm. manner. And I like the way you put that, Andy. That was a great way that you you worded um, the thoughts. Um, 
Um, I, I guess um, I am. Aaron did unless Aaron, Aaron has any common comments. No, I think I've covered covered what I would say pretty well, so I'm good. Well, I'm back to my old position again of of wanting to help the applicant to the greatest extent. And even though my motion may not make it sound like I am, it's truly an issue to ensure that um, there's clarity in, in terms of what the board is looking for. And I'm, I'm just curious, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that based on all the conversation that we've had right here, and particularly in regards to the issues associated especially with the site and the development of the site that, um, and the breaking up of the buildings, it, it almost warrants a denial as opposed to a deferral. Um, do you guys have any comments? I mean, any hard thoughts about that? I, I mean, I, I support, support the defer or denial. I, I just think on the basis of height, scale and mass, and general architectural direction when it comes to the site that I would support okay. the denial. Well, okay, you guys know me and my motions, so help me out here. I am going to um, move for denial um, for height, scale, and mass um, with um, including staff comments one through 11. And, and now y'all need to help me, um, Madam Chair, um, for comments 12 through 25, can they be included in the motion if they are uh, related to preliminary? Go ahead. Dinas, this is your motion, but I would, say, I would say that because those are suggestions to preliminary, that we should probably leave those out. I don't disagree. Um, so staff comments one through 11, um, board comments encourage the applicant to meet with the surrounding neighborhood, um, encourage the applicant to provide additional 3D renderings that represent the development more completely. To expand on a comment by staff, break building massing to, and utilize the interstitial space I'm sorry, utilize what? The interstitial space, the space in between the buildings. Um, parking that is in excess of zoning to be soft parking. Does that mean pervious? That means um, pervious grass. Yes, pervious. That's a great, thank you. And then to um, encourage the applicant, okay, help me with this. Um, encourage the applicant with the support of the board to pursue a variance. Oh, Go ahead, Andy. I would say, and once again, that we feel that there's a need to yeah, should the need applicant to, pursue a variance yeah. with DZA, the DRB will support it. Right. That's correct. I, I, I want, I, I don't want to, 
to put anything on you know on that Certainly. other than we would we would support it. I said B or B Z eggs. I want to tie it to what we were talking about. So I'll, I have it covered. Let me know when I read it back if it's incorrect. Okay. Did I leave anything out? I think it, I think that you've touched on all the points. Um, Dino, you know, so that that said, I, I would like to, if I could, add one point: is that the applicant is to find or to develop a cohesive site site plan with relationships between the buildings. If that's acceptable. Yes. What was that again, Andy? The applicant to develop a cohesive site plan with with clear relationships between the buildings. Okay. So we have a motion for denial based on staff comments one through eleven. Board comments one: encourage the applicant to meet with surrounding neighborhoods. Two: provide three D renderings that represent the development more completely. Three, expand on staff's comment to break building massings, to break up buildings and massings and utilize the space in between buildings. Four, parking in excess of zoning shall be pervious. Five, should the applicant pursue a variance with BZA in order to solve the height challenges with the split zoning, DRB will offer official support. Six, the applicant shall develop a cohesive site plan with clear relationships between the buildings. Sounds good. Is that good, Dinos? It was perfect. Is there a second? This is Andy. I'll second Dinos' motion. Thanks, Andy. I'll now call roll. Jeff? Aye in favor. Aaron? Yes in favor. And then I am also yes in favor. Thank you everyone very much. We are moving on to item number three, approval of the minutes from the April 5th, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Dinos. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Andy? Uh, yes, Ms. Andy, yes in favor. Aaron? Yes in favor. And then I am also yes in favor and we are done. Yes. I think David wanted to talk to us. Um, just briefly, um, I wanted to uh, let everybody know that there's been discussion of uh, possibly going back to live meetings. Um, only being discussed now. Um, we'll know uh, all the ins and outs. Uh, we had a meeting today that I had to miss. Um, but I just wanted to gauge everybody See how they felt that they were comfortable with coming back. If you know, of course, we would set up the room for social distancing. Um, not sure how that would work yet, but um, maybe get a second set of uh, tables for the board to space out people better. But I was just curious to see if people felt they were ready to come back in person. Absolutely. Yes. Has the city adopted the three foot distance that CDC is um, now recommending, David, as opposed to the six foot? Um... I haven't heard anything about that. Okay, so I was just curious. Um, it may have been in the in an email I missed. <laughs> Possibly. Do you know um, how soon that would start? Like what's what they're talking about as far as dates go? No, not at all. Mm. Yeah, it might be down the road a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Aaron, are you sensitive to that as you're expecting any? Well, <laughs> I mean, we're just thinking about that. I know that that's a whole other issue, but I um I technically am I'm supposed to go into quarantine. I mean, I'm coming, I'm in the office right now, I'm coming to work, but I have to go into quarantine starting on May 6th until the baby comes. Um and then, you know, I'm due May 27th. So after that, I don't know. You know, I don't. I don't quite know what my schedule will be. So that's why I was trying to figure out um, <laughs> what what the uh, the timeline looks like. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, it could be quite a ways down the road. I mean, okay. the way the wheels of government turn. Yeah, be... and David, I would think that if, you know, I'm sure Aaron's not the only one in this situation with, you know, whether expecting or immunocompromised or, or something that there would be accommodations made for public or board members to still participate virtually, I would assume. Sure, I would think would... that would be uh, a definite that we could still somehow Corporate people with Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, good job, everybody. Um, back at you. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Oh, well done. And, yeah, those were, those were tough, uh, tough items, and y'all did a great job with staff comments. Yes. And Erica, you you are my hero in in putting all of those letters together and reading names. <laughs> You were phenomenal. Yeah. I hope that it was long and, and arduous, but I, I, you know, they got to be read. And it's an important part of our process. But I mean, if the the ones for, I mean, there was a lot of just boilerplate submittals this meeting um, that people copied and pasted the same template or given it by someone on either side of the point, you know. But it was printing them out. I, I definitely killed a lot of trees today. <laughs> Well, you did a, an excellent job in walking. Oh, thank you. It's a team effort for sure. That was uh, well. Apparently, they announced on the news about the uh, Bees Ferry project um, sometime this morning, and they just mentioned the increased traffic and so forth. But they don't say anything that it's not in DRB's purview. So we got a flood of letters, um, you know, just right right this morning before the noon deadline. People yeah. there's mostly about traffic, which is in our purview. But yeah, I felt bad that they dumped all these letters on Erica. I didn't have time to. Well, they them. were just in a format that mm -hmm. wouldn't allow me to combine them to print them. So it was just one of those situations where I was having to open each file individually, print it, and then sort them to see if there was a lot of duplicates. So it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'll do that for you when we're back in person. Perfect. Done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. Yeah, I'm good with it in person, also, David. I'm all vaxxed up. Okay. Well, I'll keep you posted. Could be ways down the road. Okay. I'm right. anxious to get back and see everybody in person. Always a, yeah, always a pleasure being with you guys. Thank you so much. I know. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.